apologies everyone you'll actually see that i'm in a different state of clothing state of clothing apparently that's what i'm gonna say i'm in a different attire because this is in fact a completely different day so basically it was just a bit of an all desert all round desert i think that just sums it up for you so i'm just going to continue today with where i left off and look i've been trying to learn this script and do it off by heart um but the truth of the matter is i'm not very good at that at the moment so <laughs> i'm gonna do my best to give you eye contact it is all like my words and like things that i've picked out from studies and things but and I appreciate that I am very delayed in giving you guys this information. So I don't want to like long this out again and not get it done. So I do apologize and the content will get better. I hope, I pray, but I'm just gonna give you the gist of life. I'm not making sense. So picking up from where we left off yesterday, um, I was talking about the last point that I was talking about was about just being aware in terms of like the interpretation of results and what we look at within studies such as the heterogeneity that may influence the overall results and impact of actually what's been the information of what's been given. So a good example of this um, was a study by Bang et al in 2016. Um, this was based on women who were recovered from anorexia. And these findings show that there was no significant difference between these individuals and healthy controls in regards to brain matter. However, there was a considerable amount of clinical characteristic variability in the study participants, um, particularly in the anorexic group. So this included subtypes of binge purge and restrictive subtype, which may imply that reductions in grey matter are specific to um, particular types of anorexia. So like I said, the subtypes and things like that. Another point to consider as well is that when compared to other studies, although this sample size was fairly modest um, across the board, and it seems to be a running theme, and not just in anorexia, in a lot of um, specific study groups or the particular areas of study is that sample size can be a very limiting factor so it may not in fact um project a true representation of what may be happening and that's something that we've got to be really careful of um especially when we are looking into such particular groups and it is very difficult because in this particular population group it is quite difficult to ascertain appropriate numbers in participants. This study actually drew up another really significant point and I have mentioned this before in previous videos, at least I think I have, but I probably will again, this will be something to re reiterate. It's one of the main challenges that I think needs to be solved in all of this, which does make cross comparison studies really difficult, um, is actually having a consistent definition to specific phrases that we're using. Um, as much as it does within the discussed studies and this particular population group. So I suppose what the most important factors to consider is how we determine recovery. Now, I'm, although I'm speaking about participants who are either suffering or cu currently suffering from anorexia, as well as those who are essentially recovered, what does that mean? And you may come to find that either studies don't state what recovered means or that they have a specific characteristics that represent what that means. And that not may not be, sorry, um, consistent across the board. And so when we're interpreting results, even just having minor changes in what that means can massively influence or be significant in the overall outcome. And so like I said, it's kind of the adequacy of those definitions I don't feel like are solid enough to be able to effect effectively um, perform cross-study comparison, which is really tricky in itself or it's a bit frustrating in itself because we can't find, I guess, there's always going to be, like in science in general, you're never going to be necessarily 100% factual or accurate, um, but it does take away from the reliability or the validity of the research that we're doing. It is obviously measuring against other factors too that come with that, but 
we need to solidify those concepts of what we're using and have true definitions I guess of what they mean because it's too broad to be able to to be able to have a direct answer in what we're trying to look for. So when I was saying in regards to bang study, in regards to the definitions or the phrases that are being used. So like I said, even if it comes to do with the subgroups, so what does binging and restricting mean? Because binging to someone could actually just mean having one standard meal, obviously depending on the severity of their disorder and what they define as what binging means, that could be different across the board, even in those who you're defining as binging. So one person who thinks a meal is binging while someone else could think that they eat excessively throughout the day and that means the same thing, I guess. And you're, well, you're categorizing them into the same thing, if that makes sense. And so therefore there will just automatically be differences in that anyway. And then, so I guess that we can apply this therefore to recovery and what that means is that defined by a time frame is that just simply defined by a physical parameter so the weight restoration thing when um patients hit a specific weight is that what people regard as recovered bearing in mind that does not regard the fact that this is a mental health illness and we are not measuring the psychological side of that and i think this is where things start to get a little bit tricky and so we could apply that again to when we said about keeping patients in uh, treatment for a little bit longer after weight restoration just to see whether the psychological parameters are being positively influenced or sort of heading in the right direction rather than as soon as weight restorations happened to let them out I say let them out god it sounds terrible like they're bloody animals but you know what I mean in regards to that just like discharging and then we see that pattern of behaviors that start to slowly creep back in again so how can we truly say when one is recovered or not and that's sort of something that needs to be more solidly defined solidly solidly defined um like i've said about for a hundred millionth time next point we're gonna get on to i also keep looking this way I'm not sure why so if i'm like not looking at the camera i'm clearly looking at myself. Another factor to consider when looking into studies is the study design itself and the methodology, but as well as like the equipment used and the assessments that are applied to participants. And also as well, when applying this to brain matter, I guess it's the region of interest. Now, a lot of researchers um, may have a specific area of the brain that they're particularly interested in. And sometimes we can't see the true effect of what's going on overall if we're just simply kind of just looking into one area whilst in some respects that's valuable because it allows us to get a better understanding of that particular area and so therefore that's progressive in regards to our knowledge however finding linking relationships with other part of, parts of the brain may be inhibited may be inhibited christ I can't talk, may be inhibited um, if we're not allowing ourselves to see what's going on elsewhere. So it's kind of like, it's a little bit tricky because if we're gonna try and find interlinking pathways and mechanisms in which may be involved, it's beneficial to look on a broader scale. However, looking in depth into one specific area is also very useful in itself. So it's very difficult in that respect. But I think it's also something that's really important to consider, especially when we relate this to the task specificities within studies. And this is the next point that I'm gonna start gallivanting about. So most studies in anorexia pathophysiology utilize MRI. And um, there's another form of MRI or a method within MRI that a lot of studies have been using. And this is the functional MRI testing. So MRIs themselves actually look into any changes in the brain, whether it's to do with the brain tissue itself, as well as any atrophy that's occurring. And looking at the differences in volumes between groups and time points. So if an MRI does detect any changes in um, brain volume, uh, they can actually examine whether it's linked to any specific clinical syndrome and whether those changes are actually reversible. Now, the additional method of functional MRI actually 
assesses and looks into the metabolic function of our brain. Now whilst there are many benefits to fMRI and actually the frequency of its use is becoming more and more profound, my battery's going to die, there does appear to be a lot of cross comparison difficulty and generalizability issues purely in regards to the protocol that's used within it and so it does make it difficult to I guess measure studies between each other. Now this can be to do with anything from the difference in questions being asked, uh, pictures shown or the cognitive tasks participants are asked to perform during a study. And so because of the ch changes in protocol and things like that this may actually influence the brain area that's activated or what stimulates a particular part of the brain and so the brain areas that derived from those responses may differ between those protocols. So based on this sort of consensus I did have a little look, a little rummage through the literature and it said that from food related pictures they're shown to be an increase in activity in the dorsal posterior cingulate cortex, the insula and the amygdala and a reduced activity of the posterior mid cingulate cortex whilst a change in uh, protocol or change in picture um, to body shape related images, it showed that there was a reduction in the activity in the inferior parietal lobal. Now, I looked at that because that is a mouthful, but that is what I found. Um, so obviously depending on the type of activity, it's going to stimulate a different area of the brain. And so therefore in itself, depending on what stimulus someone is exposed to, that will have an influence on the brain area that's activated or detected or stimulated. And so crossing that over with different protocol just because it's fMRI doesn't really give a fixed reliability of those results, if that makes sense. So just because you see a study that says it's fMRI, make sure that you're checking what has been used within that whether that whether it's to do with food even if it was just like the same sort of the focus area so just it was doing an imagery test right so say if the fmri used is to do with imagery testing make sure that you're looking at the types of images images sorry that are being shown so one may be doing be to do with food one may be to do with body image as this is proven and as we see from that they stimulate different areas of the brain so it's not really accurate enough to compare those two things. Whilst it can be valuable in some respects to show that there's different areas being stimulated, it's not the same imagery being shown or the potential verbal communication that's happening between. So just be careful of that and just be considerate of that because that changes whole interpretation of what we're seeing. And like I said, there are pros and cons to this, um, but I guess, it's just being wary that if we're focused too much on one specific area, particularly for such a topic whereby it has shown that there's multiple areas affected, we may be lis listing, we may be missing potential links between um, specific brain areas that are significant in the pathophysiology of anorexia. Now, this is a really important factor that does tend to like sort of go by the wayside a little bit, which definitely shouldn't, and that is. The ratio that we have in regards to males who suffer with anorexia and females that suffer with anorexia. Now we know that this is very much not equal and so an acute amount of research actually has males within the studies. Um, a lot of it is based on female participants but just because the prevalence or known prevalence shall we say is less in males that does not mean that it isn't relevant. And I think this is so important when we come to brain function as well and the way in which we deal with things. I think it's just very much known that there are almost like traits that you tend to see in women and traits that you tend to see in men. A very generalised statement, but I think it's quite, I think it's fair to say that. And so there must be differences in brain function that allow that or that create that. And so I think it would be incredibly silly to say that 
there isn't a difference between or gender does not play a significant role in whatever's found in this and we can apply that across the board there's so many gender comparative studies shall we say um that show discrepancies and so why on earth would we rule that out in this respect just because i guess the known prevalence is more in females right now, there were hypotheses that were based on biological differences, suggesting that there are differences in serotonin, metabolism, environmental influences, as I've said, um, including things such as social functioning and spatial development. And so gender differences exist in multiple factors or in multiple ways. And there's also um, gender differences that exist in the cortical activation. And this is relating to taste in both fasting state and satiety and this is an important or relevant factor around anorexia and in eating disorders in general so if that exists again how can we be so sure that males and females have the same pathophysiology of risk factors um well we can't and i think actually it'd be such an interesting thing to have a comparison study between males and females um, who have suffered from anorexia still very much understudied and underappreciated I think and it's sad that also males don't I don't feel like they are or feel they are much supported in this as much I've said that's I said that very poorly um, I don't know if that's um, a valid thing to say um, but if any of you guys know any males or if you're watching and you're male and you've experienced an eating disorder or you're currently in the midst of an eating disorder, it would be actually really valuable for you guys to comment below and sort of tell me your experience that you found within this. And you know, it is sort of a known thing that males don't tend to seek help and unfortunately hasn't always best led best to the statistics in regards to suicide and things like that. And so this is such an important factor especially knowing the statistics of suicide in this disorder in general. Not saying that, that that's what it ultimately leads to, um, but obviously I guess it's just sh showing how significant this this disorder is on mental well-being and everyone should feel like they can turn for help in this respect and feel like they can get helped and not just sort of like left by the wayside, as I like to say that phrase apparently and this is about helping everyone and we can't necessarily just carry over information that we know in females into males we have different reproductive systems even when we just as simplistically as say about hormones we've got different types of hormones we've got estrogen they've got testosterone it was a very very generalized thing but you know what i mean even that in itself makes a significant difference and so i just think we just need to address this a little bit more another quick point that i want to make it's not actually a quick point but i'm going to make it a quick point is that in these studies as well um not all the time but and this is sometimes controlled for in studies so this is again something to be aware of is that um a lot of participants i say a lot um or some participants may be on some form of medication whether it's to do with coexisting disorders or conditions that they have to take specific medication for and whether this is to do with controlling things such as depression that tends to come with um, anorexia not necessarily all the time but things like that that in itself we know has um, alterations on brain function um, brain volume um, and brain matter and so that's something that's really important to consider when interpreting results as well and so it's just being wary of is it medication that's influencing these alterations in brain function and this may be a reason for why we're not seeing you know like predicted outcomes and things like that um and maybe why i guess the longevity of brain alterations isn't happening at a rate at which is desired things like that and it's just important to see whether that in itself does have an effect on the brain so i know it was a very very messy vlog and i do apologize um and i just wanted to from this i basically just wanted to get a general consensus on sort of what to look out for when you are looking at studies and whether there is an effect and sort of what the information has told us i'm not entirely sure whether i actually even answered my bloody own question 
But you know, we're just talking and I just get a little bit too intense with it all. It was a relatively brief overview um, of brain matter alterations in anorexia. Um, it is very clear that um, a pathophysiological cause is still yet to be fully determined. However, it suggested that the mechanisms um, that lead to anorexia are related to dysfunctions within certain areas of the brain um, and neurological circuits of which may be influenced by multiple factors. Now this includes age, this includes BMI, duration of illness, to name a few. There are many factors that need to be considered within this and how we interpret that is dependable on that information. And so based on the information that I've terribly provided and the fMRI studies that are currently available, it would be I guess it would be valuable to consider these characteristics um, in future studies of which may improve treatment strategies that we utilise uh, in the process and in the referral schemes and things like that. And by improving treatment strategies within specific subtypes um, of the condition um, and also improve cerebral function, that may positively affect recovery um, longevity and limit the time of relapse I guess. Limit. Definitely said that wrong, did not mean that. I'm basically trying to say so you don't relapse as soon as you walk out the treatment centre doors. That is what I'm trying to say, I can't, I'm so sorry. Blimineck. That was, that was intense and I'm really, I'm, I'm very sorry if I did not get my point across but I'm kind of hoping that it was clear, it probably wasn't. Um, I honestly feel like, like I said, I did not answer my bloody question so that's just great in itself but I do hope in some way this is quite informative and just to show you the complexity of what we're dealing with here. Otherwise it's an absolute disaster and it just bloody pointless so that's very good but like I said the more we go and the more we sort of delve into specific areas and things like that I am hoping that this is going to get better and we can sort of like highlight specific characteristics or distinctive parts that you may want to go away and look at yourself and think actually that seems quite interesting or that seems like that could be something and bring your ideas to the forefront of what you think because I'm just sort of like relaying information and trying to give my interpretation as well as giving information out and things like that and I'm just a complete mess so and my notes on my screen not helping me at all because I keep looking down and you must think she has no bloody clue what she's talking about I am learning as I go um, and some words are just too long for me to even remember so I do apologise. If there is anything that you'd like me to elaborate on uh, in a better way, if you're like Charlotte I did not understand what you said there, can you please sort of just expand on that? Yes I can and I would do my best and I'm very sorry. And you'll probably want me to do the whole bloody thing again because it was absolutely terrible. But please leave a message in the comments below and I will go through and answer your questions, uh, anything that you have. And before you leave, I know you probably did not enjoy the video, but please give it a like and a thumbs up, just if you, even if you just feel sorry for me because I just said like and thumbs up, so that's really good. Please remember to give this a video a thumbs up and to subscribe to my channel because it really helps the cause and sort of bring more information to light, even if it's just terribly put which probably doesn't help the cause either, but <laughs> I'm trying to do my best to sort of help this community in like in a positive way and I hope you can see my passion for that too. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you guys sticking around for my waffling. Um, I hope it's somewhat entertaining even if you're just looking at me like, what a lost soul. Either way, it's what it is. But I hope you, I hope, hope, where am I going? What, what part of the country am I at now? But I do hope you've enjoyed this video and it was somewhat informative and it's made you think about things um, in a different way or just being more appreciative of how much it does affect your brain um, and just being, remember to be a bit more kind to yourself in that respect knowing that because I don't think even I have before learning all of this stuff or reading all this stuff just how much it has affected the old noggin um, and unfortunately how it takes longer to undo something than it does to do it. I really hope that made sense. <laughs> but you get my drift. But we will get there. Um, it's figuring it out and helping each other along the way. So yes, until next time, which will probably be like a day in the life jobby, a bit more of an entertaining video because 
I need a bloody brain break. I can't even speak. Like, why did I do that noise? Hello? Until next time, guys, I will see you soon. Hopefully more soon than this because my schedule is awful. But I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for watching. And enjoy life.